Welcome to FinScale, a podcast created by Solen Niederkorn, shedding light on innovation in finance, banking, and insurance. SAS, a comprehensive look with a veteran investor. Hilal Zidel, Managing Director at Kenneth Partners. We leverage technology to collect data on you know, hundreds of thousands of companies. You know, we use analytics and algorithms to determine which of these companies are the most interesting. And we focus on proactively outreaching to those companies. And technology has played a part you know, throughout the journey in this. And you know, we're now using AI, we're using generative AI to do this. And I think what, what we've seen is this has really given us quite a good bump in efficiency. I've been discussing SaaS on the podcast for years. In his renowned article, Why Software is Eating the World, Mark Andreessen explained that the software would take over large portions of the economy driven by the proliferation and success of the SaaS model. This model has shifted us from physical and localized systems to global, scalable, and efficient software solutions. 13 years after these insights, What do we think about SaaS? It's a topic I've been eager to explore with an expert. Hillel, who has years of experience investing in B2B SaaS, joined me for this discussion. We covered many topics, including the evolution of pricing models, the value proposition, the transformation of incumbents, the shift to cloud-based services, and more recently, topics related to AI. This was an opportunity for me to introduce you to Kenneth, whom I know well. We discussed the funds, the thesis, and certain investments such as Elumi, which have exited. These investments allows us to talk about KPIs and the role of sustainable growth in investment decisions. Enjoy the show! Hello, everyone. Hi, Hillel. Hi, Selene. Great to, great to talk to you. Yeah, I'm very happy to have you on the podcast um, to talk about uh, software as a service, uh, to talk about uh, Kenneth. Prior to that, can I ask you to quickly introduce yourself and tell a bit uh, about um, your background and uh, your way to and your path to Kenneth Partners? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a managing director at Kenneth Partners. Um, we are a growth equity fund focused on investing Uh, pretty much exclusively in business-to-business software companies that have been bootstrapped. Um, prior to Kenneth, uh, I was uh, actually working with growth companies on the uh, debt side as a, as a lender to, to high-growth companies providing um, loans with, uh, with equity warrants. Um, in my earlier career, I worked in management consulting and then right at the beginning, actually worked at a few uh, B2B tech startups. And that's where I first Uh, got really interested in in the world of, of B2B technology. And I'm, I'm originally from South Africa. Okay, so Hillel, I invited you on the podcast because some people listening to us know a board member in your Lux uh, entities, uh, so I know quite well Kenneth Partners, and I find that uh, you have a, an interesting play in software as a service. This is a, a topic that I've been diving into with a former guest on my French channel uh, called uh, Nicolas Collin. We had uh, an interesting discussion, uh, the two of us, not about the family, about the way he was envisaging the evolution of VC. Considering that you have been investing for years now in a SaaS model, I wanted to start with this uh, and focus on, on that specifically. How has the software as a service model changed uh, its core structure and uh, delivery mechanisms since its inception, when you think like 15 or 20 years ago? Sure. So, yeah, we, we, we're, you know, we've been investing in software for sort of north of 20 years or so, and, and obviously you've seen a lot of changes in the category. I mean, in, in the early days of, of software investing, it was very much investing in businesses that sold through a license-based model, which meant you would uh, go out and your customer would pay you a big upfront license, and then uh, there'd maybe be some services, and then they'd pay you, you know, 15 or 20% percent maintenance as long as they, they use the service. And the customer would really buy and own the service, and it would be located within the customer's premise, you know, similar to when you you know, buy office CD and then it's sort of on your, on your, on your local machine. Um, and, you know, a number of software companies did well in that, uh, in that area. And, and we had a number of successes um, in the category, you know, a, a, around the sort of early 2000s, um, the model started to move to software as a service. Um, and so, you know, this had a number of uh, really impactful changes 
on a category. You know, f- firstly, um, rather than the customer owning the software, they're essentially licensing it. So instead of paying, you know, a million dollars up front and then 200k per annum, they'd be paying a recurring subscription every year, um, essentially licensing the software. Um, and then the second aspect is the delivery mechanism. You know, rather than the customer owning and hosting it, um, the service would be hosted in the cloud. Um, and you know, from a from a company perspective, this is just much more uh, scalable, much more you know, configurable. I think what's really uh, interesting from an investment perspective is, you know, software investing used to be a lot more risky than it is these days because it was very much dependent on how you, you know, how successfully your sales were in that month, that quarter, that year. Um, what SaaS did is it introduced this really you know, nice recurring revenue model. So you have a base of annual recurring revenue in the same way that you know a bank or an insurance company may have an annuity income stream, and then um, you're adding to that uh, every quarter. And what this means is you're really um, stabilizing your revenue much more than it was under a license uh, under a license model. Um, and I think this you know coincides with a huge amount of private equity investment into the software market because you know this was previously seen as a bit risky on the tech side, uh, and then uh, you know investors understood that actually um, this is much more predictable and and safe and more, and more akin to a typical private equity uh, t- type investment. Um, so that's I, I think that's probably the you know the, the main change, the, the main you know, shift in, in in software, the movement from on premise to um, you know, to, to recurring revenue SaaS, um, and then that, that SaaS itself has you know has evolved. Um, a lot, you know, uh, with um, APIs, you know, uh, software solutions, you know, talking to each other in an integrated way. Obviously, the advent, you know, mobile, um, you know, has had a big impact on the SaaS uh, market, where a number of areas, you know, c- clients are accessing their solutions uh, via the mobile uh, device. So, you know, integrations, security, compliance, and, and, and what, uh, what have you. And I think um, I'm sure we'll talk more about AI, but I think you know we're at Kind of the next, you know, big, uh, you know, change in 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 the tech market in, in impacting SaaS and other areas, you know, which, which is AI. Yes, it's it's very interesting. It's more or less uh, aligned with what Nicola was telling me. Interesting. In what ways do you think that uh, the expansion of this uh, model influenced uh, traditional uh, industries? So I'm I'm thinking, of course, of uh, uh, more uh, finance uh, sector because this is the one I know the most. And um, those um, players were really slow incorporating. Uh, even uh, cloud uh, technologies, uh, and now they are keen on using so- uh, software as a service. So do you think that they have uh, integrated the model also uh, in the way they approach their own clients? So w- w- what we've seen you know, over the last few years is the rollout of SaaS solutions across multiple industries. Um, and you know some industries have been much quicker to adopt software solutions than uh, you know, than others. I think, um, yeah, I read a stat a few years ago, something like 15, 20% you know, of markets had been you know, penetrated by software and that, that, that was great. So, so I think there's, there's still a lot of open space. I think you mentioned banking and financial services. This is an interesting one. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in some areas, particularly on the smaller side of the fintech side, there's been a you know, very significant uh, adoption of SaaS. You know, within banking, this is, been slower and taken, you know, much longer because of, you know, large legacy solutions within banks that have been put together, you know, through multiple acquisitions. Um, but I think, you know, from a customer perspective, uh, you know, the ability to um, leverage software, uh, you know, within your mobile banking apps, within your investment management apps, and, you know, what, what have you, has been hugely beneficial. But I think, you know, our view is that there's a long way to go in terms of, Kind of the sassification of, of industries. Um, you know, we see within the ultimate, you know, customer base, banks, insurance, healthcare, what have you. Um, you know, there's a lot of areas, a lot of divisions that still need to take on SaaS solutions, which you know, which makes us very excited about you know, the next kind of five to ten years of, of investing in SaaS companies selling to you know, to these industries. I read uh, a few weeks ago a blog I read uh, written by Thomas uh, Tongons. I don't know if I pronounce his name correctly. You know, the, mm. this VC uh, guy. Sure. <laughs> 
he was um, writing something about regulation, telling that, you know, builders don't take care about regulation and all those concerns and data privacy. I'm not, I don't agree with this. And particularly in uh, fintech, uh, this is a major concern, uh, not only in uh, Europe, but uh, across uh, the globe. You know, with all those growing concerns about data privacy and, and regulation, how do you think that software as a service solution have been influenced in also in the way they scale their businesses uh, worldwide? And do you agree with Thomas or, or do you think that that it's, as me, a concern that is absolutely critical for uh, builders in that area? It depends on, you know, what the product is and what the client is. So... You know, where you're selling solutions to individuals, you know, which are um, nice to have, not mission critical, you know, um, security and compliance is, 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 is obviously important. Uh, GDPR, um, when, when you're selling to large institutions, it's absolutely critical. So, you know, what we uh, typically see happening is, Um, the business unit sponsor wants to buy the product and then it goes through a procurement process and there's a long period of evaluating the security. So it really, it's not a nice to have, it's not optional, it's really table stakes to be selling, you know, solutions to you know, to, uh, to, to corporate customers. Um, the, the more um, value that can be delivered, you know, by, by a company, Um, means that they need access to more data, more information, and your clients need to feel absolutely comfortable that you know, you've got the best uh, security and compliance uh, practices in place. So I, I, I think that um, historically it was an inhibitor to companies taking on software solutions because they were worried about it. You know, today, um, mo most vendors see this as really critical to their ability to sell and deliver, you know, meaningful software solutions. And I think it will only become, you know, more and more relevant as more data, um, you know, gets inputted into, into these solutions. Interesting. There is uh, one topic that you mentioned is uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So there is a, a lot of noise uh, around mm. this and all those technologies, uh, those last uh, months in particular. How do you see... Um, SaaS evolving, bearing in mind that uh, they need absolutely, and all of them more or less, integrate uh, all these technologies within the solution. And uh, what will be the impact for their, the customers of those solutions? Do you see already some trends? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the, the market is is evolving. You know, we, we've been um, we've been investing in AI based companies for a long time now. Probably, you know, 2014, 15 was when, when we started. So I think what we're seeing in AI is this is really kind of a step change in AI capabilities, but AI is not, you know, is not, is not new. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of noise in the market. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of hype in the market. You know, some of it is, it's very real and, and, and other aspects of it, you know, I think are maybe uh, kind of less, less real, but from a, You know, if you're if you're a B2B SaaS company today, I think every business needs to be looking at how they can uh, leverage AI um, as an opportunity, and you know what are the the threats and the risks that AI um, pose to their business. I think um, you know cu customers really care about customer value. You know, I, I I don't think an AI solution is in itself interesting to a customer if it's going to deliver something, um, you know, uh, that they could get, you know, through, through a traditional, uh, through a traditional solution. So I think, um, you know, every single B2B SaaS company needs to have an AI roadmap. Uh, we're starting to see customers asking for it. You know, again, it's, it's not that the customer, um, needs the AI solution for what they're doing today, but they want to know that the vendor that they're signing for a long-term period, um, it, you know, has a, has a clear plan of how they're going to, leverage and implement um, mm -hmm. AI going forward. Okay, good. Interesting. I mean, it's more aligned align with what I read and what I see, but it's great to hear it from you. Uh, can you say a few words about uh, the launch of Kenneth Partners? Uh, because it's been a, a player since now uh, many, many years. And uh, when I talk about Kenneth to VC, uh, everyone knows you. So yeah, a little bit about the history and the investment thesis 
for the audience and those who don't know you? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been investing, uh, you know, since 1997. We focused purely on growth capital, you know, since uh, about 2007. And, you know, we have a very, very focused strategy. So the strategy is B2B software only, and then in companies that have been bootstrapped or built in a capital efficient way. So, you know, what bootstrap means to us is a business that has been built to scale without reliance on external capital. You know, this is very different to traditional venture capital companies that, you know, may have raised a you know, bunch of money, have burned that money, now raising again. The typical company that you know, we love investing in has got to, you know, five, 10, 20 million in annual recurring revenues, um, probably hasn't raised any money, or if they have, it's a very small amount from maybe from, from friends and family. And we partner with these companies to support on the expansion, you know, to the next stage. So um, we typically work with, you know, companies in three ways. The first is supporting a bootstrap founder in building a world-class management team. Um, so this means uh, second-level management team, board-level board level managers. Um, and we're introducing people who've done it before in a capital-efficient way. Secondly, international expansion. You know, one of the key reasons that companies choose to work with us is because we can support them in their international uh, aspirations, particularly to the U.S. market, where, where, we, have, where we have a team. Uh, and then finally, you know, we support companies on what we think of as you know, strategic value. So this may be developing channel partnerships. Uh, this may be bolt-on acquisition strategies. Um, this may be you know, consolidating the industry. Um, and you know, I think, interestingly, these are companies that typically don't need money. You know, they're not burning capital, running out of capital, but they have an option to further accelerate, increase the, you know, the, the development and, and the growth. Um, and, you know, certainly in Europe, we're probably the only group exclusively focused on this category of bootstrap, you know, highly capital efficient, you know, high growth B2B SaaS companies. Mm -hmm. And how many funds did you raise? We're, we're very fortunate to be investing our sixth fund at the moment. The Kenex Six, yes. And uh, there is an interesting exactly. um, relationship uh, you have built with uh, Edmond Rothschild. Can you say a few words about this? Because I find it uh, interesting. Yeah, so we, we've known uh, Johnny and, and Edmund Rothschild since probably about 2018 or so. Um, I mean, important to say, you know, we, we're an independent firm and we've been operating, you know, for, for a long time independently. And our relationship with, with EDR is such that, you know, as you mentioned, they're a, a very important investor in the fund. Um, but we see them as a strategic, uh, you know, strategic investor in that, in addition to their own investment, um, you know, they support us on the fundraising side. So through their uh, private bank and asset management arm, uh, you know, have supported in raising, you know, significant, uh, you know, sums of capital from, from a, a very complementary LP base, you know, to our own LP base, um, and, you know, support on some of the, uh, you know, the, the administration side. We've worked with them uh, from Kenneth 5 and into Kenneth 6. Um, you know, it's been a great uh, relationship, great partnership. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we, you know, we see as really, really interesting and valuable. Okay, so you didn't really talk about your investments. Uh, I wanted you to maybe take a few of them and explain to us uh, the reason why you invested. And, and also, interesting, in parallel to that, explain to us also the nature of the KPIs that you were initially following for those companies and that you needed to adapt because the KPIs, as you said, evolve over the time because of the SaaS model completely changed over the last 15 years. That it could be interesting to take one of you examples and illustrate the, the KPIs that you initially prioritized and now the one that you decide to follow? Sure. So maybe, maybe uh, I mean, we, um, we had an exit uh, a couple of months ago of uh, Kenneth, one of our earlier portfolio companies uh, called Illumi. So maybe I'll, I'll talk about that because that uh, is kind of a recent example of, of, of something we worked on. So Illumi is a business uh, started in Denmark in the learning and performance, man performance management category. Uh, the company had done really well in the local market, providing a solution which was really focused on um, learning within mid-market companies. Uh, we met Klaus, the founder, and the team in London in about you know, 2019 or so. And um, their aspiration was really to expand. You know, they, they, were not, they didn't need capital that a you know, healthy balance sheet, um, that a very good product, and 
they wanted to expand internationally. And so, you know, what we liked about this uh, about this company was first the you know strong team. Um, the, the CEO class had, had built a company previously in a in a very different category, but you know had real business experience. Um, it's a solution that you know serves multiple industries, but with a very clear um, you know customer uh, value proposition. And so we invested in the business. Uh, I think total investment of about 15 million euros. Um, and we did three things with the company. The first was you know helping them build a team. So we brought on board you know, Pete Daffin as chairman. Pete is a you know, multiple-time CEO, uh, you know, experienced chairman, you know, real, real business builder. Um, we helped support in the development of the second-level management team around uh, around uh, Klaus, the founder. Um, the international expansion was key. So we initially supported them in their UK expansion, which was an area where they were getting you know good uh, good traction. Um, and then ultimately uh, supported in developing the U.S. market, where uh, the team actually moved to. Uh, we brought in a, a chairman, uh, supported in external uh, you know, follow-on funding to roll out the U.S. Uh, US um, development, and then supported on channel partnerships. Uh, you know, the company grew probably five times, just under five times um, over our, our holding period. Um, and then you know, we sold the business to Ceridian, uh, which is a, a U.S.-based. Uh, about a 10 billion market cap HR software company, uh, you know, making a, a, a very attractive return uh, for our investors. And this is sort of a classic case of what we like doing, you know, uh, investing in a company that's got a great product, um, you know, good customer base, and we can support in uh, helping to scale the, these companies out. And, um, you know, we've been very active this year. We've done two more uh, new new investments. Um, in similar types of stories, you know, h- high growth, you know, capital efficient slash, you know, or, or bootstrap companies, um, great product, you know, customers really like them, um, and you know, looking for a partner to support on the uh, international expansion and, and and supporting on, you know, just creating a really strategic and, and valuable asset. But in terms of KPIs, what are the top three KPIs? that you have in mind when you meet them. And um, again, uh, maybe going back to earlier deals, um, do you keep the same KPIs than 15 years ago? <laughs> yeah, great, great, great. great. So, um, I mean, I think the key things we're looking at first is growth. You know, we, 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 we want to invest in companies that have revenue growth. Of, you know, our minimum is 30%, but you know, ideally higher, you know, 40, 50, 70, 80%. percent um, The second is capital efficiency. So, you know, we we don't you know, invest in companies that you know have to burn a lot burn a lot of capital, um, you know, to get to the, to the point where, where we're investing. So, um, you know, typically these companies they may be profitable, they may break even. If they are losing money, it's you know, it's a small amount. So that you know that um, efficiency is really important to us. And then, you know, probably the third metric I'd say is retention. So, you know, we. Our focus is on mission critical or essential products and services. And so if a customer is purchasing your software and every six months, 12 months, you're losing customers, you know, that, that turn, you know, we see as problematic. So there's lots of ways to measure retention, but ultimately this is, uh, you know, do the customers buy the service and continue to use it um, without, without, uh, without churning. Um, I mean, the things that I'll tell you, the, th- the things that, you know, are sort of red flags for us when we're looking at businesses, you know, um, I'd say the first one is customer concentration. So we're very, very skeptical if you've got, you know, one or two customers that account for a very large proportion of your overall mm-hmm. revenue. That's that's something that um, you know, historically we've just taken the view that you, you cannot mitigate uh, that risk. H- high churn, you know, cu- customers you know, ch- churning out frequently is, um, is problematic. Um, in terms of uh, how, how the KPIs have evolved, I, I think the core things we value ha- have not changed. You know, this is good growth, good capital efficiency, And all the metrics around customers really liking and, and valuing the product. Clearly, there's lots of nuance. I mean, we, you know, we, we have a dashboard that each of our companies completes, which is very detailed around all the metrics that you know you'd want to 
you'd want to dig into, you know, your customer lifetime value, your customer acquisition cost, all, 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 all that sort of stuff. Um, but these are just really granular ways of determining um, return on investment. You know, if I'm going to invest, you know, 10, 20, 30 million you know, dollars in the company, how is the company going to grow? How is sales uh, going to expand and perform, you know, beyond that? Um, you know, usage measures. I, 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 I think, I, I guess what, what, what I'm saying is there are a lot of detailed metrics that we look at, we track, we evaluate, um, but the top level ones are the same, which mm-hmm. is, you know, growth, efficiency, and, uh, you know, customers really valuing the product. So you said growth. We talk more and more about sustainable growth versus a rapid scaling. And there is more and more a shift, huh, of course, in the industry and across all industries. Do you think that this shift has an impact on your investment strategy and the way you approach uh, entrepreneurs? I mean, we, we so, so probably you saw this the most in the sort of 2019 to 2021 period where you had, you know, a combination of low interest rates, COVID uh, meant that there was just really a kind of massive inflow into uh, software companies and companies had this kind of growth at all costs model um you know we, as men we've been doing this over 25 years we have a very consistent model which is about investing in uh you know sensible growth stories um we don't uh we're not chasing um kind of a unicorn type return we want all of our companies to be successful uh we really hate losing money on deals and so you know we we're, we're targeting a 3x plus Uh, return when we invest, but we're not targeting a, a, a 20x, um, you know, 30x t- type investment, and, and taking the type of risk that that you have where you, where you have you have failures. So we really observed this phenomenon, you know, over the last few years of just growth at all costs. You know, we're very fortunate that we did not participate in it. We you know, we remained very disciplined, and you had a a very swift kind of you know reversion um, from the investors to a Um, kind of a profitability type focus. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're seeing uh, companies, funds in evaluating, you know, small businesses and looking at their profitability metrics. I think, you know, for us, the key, the key point is growth is the number one driver of return. Um, profitability isn't. So, you know, if you're investing in 10 million euro uh, SaaS company um, that's going to stay at 10 million for three years, but you're going to grow even dar from one to three, you know, that is, Deeply un- un- uninteresting. On the other hand, you know, if you're going to try and grow from you know, 10 to 100 and burn 100, that, that's deeply uninteresting also. So what we want to do is we want to grow these businesses at a good clip in a very efficient way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not about specifically generating cash flow, but it's about investing sensibly and sustainably. So really understanding the relationship between how much I'm investing in sales and marketing and what the payback is. And if those metrics are really good, I'm going to invest more because mm-hmm. it's economically rational you know, to do that. Um, but we're not uh, you know, speculative in investing mm-hmm. and um, allowing, the, uh, you know, allowing the losses to, to pile up like, uh, like the, sort of the traditional VC model does. Makes sense. Okay, Hillel, we have just a little bit of time left. Um, this is a topic that I've been discussing with Johnny, so I'm <laughs> happy to uh, dive with you today about the AI and uh, its impact also on your organization. And I would say not AI, but uh, more tech. So how, uh, what are the different tools that you, years after years, implemented within uh, your organization to improve your daily operations, to also be more efficient uh, with regard to the, uh, the deal flow management? Can you elaborate on, a little bit on, on this? Sure. So, you know, the, the key to our, uh, our strategy is we, we don't um, you know, want to be investing in competitive auction processes where, you know, we're receiving um, beautiful presentations and, and you know, b- being the highest payer in a, in a bank process. And so over the last, you know, 10, 10 years plus, we developed a, a process which we call the predictive model, which is a way whereby we leverage technology to collect data on you know, hundreds of thousands of companies. You know, we use analytics and algorithms to determine which of these companies are the most interesting, and we focus on proactively outreaching to those, to those companies. And technology has played a part you know, th- throughout the journey in this. 
And, you know, we're now using AI, we're using generative AI to do this. And I think what, what we've seen is this has really given us quite a good bump in efficiency. So it's not really changing what we're doing, which is really collecting data on hundreds of thousands of companies and scoring them and figuring out which ones are the most interesting, but it's enabling us to do that in the sort of 30 to 40% uh, you know, more, efficiency, uh, more efficiency way. I think there's lots more you can do. I think there is a, you know, there's a balance between becoming, uh, you know, sort of too dependent on, on AI. So I'm sure you notice when you get emails that are AI generated, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we're trying to uh, continue to be um, relationship driven, you know, personalized, you know, f- focus on trying to build relationships with, with, with companies. Um, and so we're not really using it in our communication style. Mm-hmm. Um, but just in terms of leveraging AI to collect uh, more and more data information the companies that we think are interesting, I think is, is something that we, we find valuable. Um, and then, you know, just to say on the investment judgment side, this is not an area where, where we're using AI. You know, our, our view is that, um, you know, we, the benefit of AI is sort of, you know, put in the desk and then ultimately, you know, we need, need to apply our own judgment on you know, whether this is something that we, we want to you know, invest in. Good to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, so so this is something that you built internally. Did you recruit some engineers, or yeah. um, did you buy potentially some tools? No, we bu- we built it. We're very fortunate to have amazing uh, team members who uh, are extremely capable um, and have you know learned and developed. And you know the system, as I say, has evolved over time. Uh, but it's a it's a you know it's a kind of our own tool that we mm-hmm. uh, we use and. Um, you know, I think if you want to be investing in, in bootstrap companies, you have two challenges. The first one is finding the most interesting companies out there that are not looking for capital. And so you have to be smart on uh, sourcing. Yeah, and the second is con- convincing them to work with you. And so, you know, the relationship management side of it is, is really key. So th- those are the things that we spend you know, every day uh, working on uh, improving. Perfect. So what are your next steps at Kenneth Partners? Um, yeah, so I mean, we're we're really excited about um, you know, what we're seeing in the market um, at the moment. We, we 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 don't want to change too much. We continue to focus on bootstrap B two B SaaS companies. Um, you know, we're excited about you know the ability for AI to really increase the market size of uh, our existing portfolio and 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 and, and potential potential new uh, portfolio companies. Um, yeah, we're excited about what we're seeing in in Europe and the UK. Um, uh, yeah, and the ability to expand these companies into into the US market. Um, so it's a continuation of what we've been doing you know, over the last twenty five years. Just hopefully doing it uh, a bit better each each year. Perfect. Congrats for what you did. Hillel, my conclusion is always a, a book or a podcast or a recommendation uh, for the uh, listeners. So what do you recommend to us today? Um, so in terms, of, in terms of books, this is quite a tough question to narrow it down to one book. I feel like there's, the, the, there's, the, there's a lot that I, I want to talk about, but, but I think the, the one that I think is most relevant maybe to kind of you know, business and scaling is a, is the book Shoe Dog, ah, which yes. is the book uh, by Phil Knight. You know, the story of Nike, just a kind of, I, I sort of see that as like the ultimate, you know, entrepreneurial story uh, encompassing every aspect of kind of vision, challenge, you know, operation, politics, all, all, all that kind of stuff. So anyone who has not, not read that, I, I would strongly encourage them to, uh, to read that and then uh i mean in terms of podcasts I, I love listening to podcasts things like um acquired is a great podcast you know it d- deeply goes into um business building um the podcast founders uh of course you heard that uh, another really uh really good one um Huberman lab in terms of science and biology um, yeah, but it's a long yeah, one. Hubert kind of <laughs> Manlab, yeah, it's yeah. like you need to go for a big run. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's it's good if you're like traveling through an airport and flying and you've got That's three good. hours to, um, to kill. It's called Invest Like the Best with uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, another really, really good one. 
We can do a separate talk on podcasts. I'm very <laughs> passionate about it. No, it goes without saying. Okay, thank you very much, Hillel. That was very nice. Thank you for your time. Great to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you all for listening and sharing this moment with us. Don't hesitate to contact me on Twitter or LinkedIn to share your comments and reactions. You can also rate this episode on your favorite podcast platform. See you soon.